You're listening to Neo Cash Radio. We discuss the future of money today. In the studio with you, it's JJ, Darren, and Pedro. Extension blocks and Bitcoin look to upset the core V Unlimited battle. Ethereum-based token debit card is in the works. Wells Fargo gets sued by Bitfinex. And much more here on episode 202, Wednesday, April 12, 2017. Darren? In the traditional markets, we have gold up to 1287 Silver's up to $18.45. Oil's up to $52.82, and the Dow is down to 20,591 points. The 30-year Treasury uh, yield is down as well to uh, 2.89%. In the crypto markets, Bitcoin is up to $1,222. Litecoin is up to $11.77. Ethereum is up to $47.50. And Dash is down to $67.59. Now, mind you, that is up from earlier in the week. Uh, Zcash is up to 63.77. And Monero is up to 22.47. Wow. Yeah, just a reminder, you can tune into Neocash Radio every Wednesday night. Don't want to miss out on a single moment of awesome Neocash content, including special episodes and bonus interviews. Subscribe to our podcast on Google Play Music, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, YouTube, Podcast Addict, and more. Well... Starting out tonight, we are. It's an interesting story, and maybe a twist. Uh, there have been a long history of banks having uh, sort of, sort of a uh, an issue with Bitcoin businesses. So, Wells Fargo is facing a lawsuit over suspension of outgoing wire transfers for Bitfinex. Now, towards the end of last month, Wells Fargo suspended the outgoing wire transfers for Bitfinex and correspondent accounts with no explanation or appeal. This is not a new story when it comes to Bitcoin businesses and banks. The twist here is that incoming deposits are still working just fine. This is reminiscent of the situation with the Chinese exchanges allowing deposits while halting withdrawals. Now, we talked about this in episode 199 when uh, we, the, uh, the title Chinese Bitcoin Exchange goes full retard. And, and they basically wanted to know every single detail of how you got these Bitcoins once they, once they resumed operations. And uh, moving on, the, the lawsuit has been filed in the U.S. District Court of Northern District of California, San Francisco Division, and lists four plaintiffs, BFX, WW Incorporated, BFX, NA Incorporated, iFinix Incorporated, and Tether Limited. They are demanding a jury trial. The lawsuit claims that Wells Fargo has, quote, substantially interfered with the plaintiff's ability to operate their business and honor their contractual obligations to their cost- customers, unquote. Bitfinex will be seeking damages to be determined by the jury, and the plaintiffs are requesting at least $75,000 in compensatory damages and anything else the court wants to throw in. So this is a, a an in, this court case, I think, will determine a lot when it yeah. comes to business, uh, Bitcoin businesses and banks, or crypto businesses, I yeah, should say. Yeah, it's like, will they be served by traditional banks or not? And, and of course, uh, if, if uh, Wells Fargo wanted to uh, drop them as a customer or as a client, they could probably do that in a more uh, reasonable way like give them some notice or something like that right and instead of you know they're still accepting incoming right so well uh moving on we're looking at uh stampery a blockchain add-on for microsoft office pedro what's going on with that yeah stampery provides the ability to certify and verify documents against both bitcoin and ethereum blockchains via a web page or an api wow uh, so we have a link to the story uh, once the hash data is present on the public blockchain the document can't be changed without invalidating the hash uh, so this approach guarantees both the document's privacy and the data's availability for future validation um, Stampery provides this functionality today by creating hashes of documents submitted through the web and storing them on the Ethereum and Bitcoin public blockchains, the hash of it, that is. Uh, so, um, you know, th- this is really interesting because now you have a-, a place that you can store documents where, you know, traditionally they might be in databases or, you know, at down at the city hall, but sure. now you can actually certify certain documents. Maybe this is where, you know, house titles will go or transfers of ownership. Yeah, no, it's 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 awesome to have this sort of functionality added to a Microsoft Office. I mean, if you're looking at, I mean, all the documents that might pass through, and and to have this ability to to interlink with the blockchains, yeah, uh, and, and have a, a place where you can, you know, like I, if I sold you a car, it might have the hash of some document that has the VIN number, and and now you know it's linked to you. Yep, it's great stuff. Uh, 
So moving on, the uh, a quick story here. There was a recent uh, missile strike in Syria, and we typically don't get into too much of this, the war-related stuff. But it's interesting to note from an economic perspective that the 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 missiles launched costed a certain amount of money. I believe it was the whole thing around a hundred million. But the companies that make them saw a a uh, uh, what was it one one uh, percent each. So each each company basically went up about one percent in stock value, oh, wow. and it equated to uh, I believe a five billion dollar uh, rise in value, something to like that, something like that. So uh, it's funny how the, the the war is a racket sort of situation is still very much true, even now. Uh, moving on to other stories, the Bitcoin extension blocks. Now this is something new I hadn't heard of, but they're ready for liftoff. So, have you guys heard of Bitcoin extension blocks yet? Not really. All right, so no, not at all. Bitcoin Core and Bitcoin Unlimited may have some new competition for the Bitcoin block size solution. In this scenario, the current block being mined is referred to as the canonical block. Canonical block. Canonical block. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> it would remain relatively the same, and an extension block would be stapled onto the end of it. This is an opt-in situation where the extension block will have advanced technology built in, including lightning network capability. And also included in the solution is a malleability fix needed to further enable smart contracts on Bitcoin. Now, older clients will still be able to use Bitcoin as it is now because they'll, they'll see the, the uh, conical block and the, they won't see the extension block. Uh, but those who upgrade will be able to see the, the full blockchain, both extension and mechanical. Doesn't this just seem like an, you know, scrapping an altcoin on top of Bitcoin? It, it does seem that way. Um, like it's riding the coattails of the Bitcoin blockchain as its own separate layer. It, yes. It's, Weird. It, it does. Here's the thing. It does seem like a win-win for all interested parties. The Bitcoin core block will remain the same, while the opt-in block will result in an immediate increase in block size and it'll have lightning network capabilities. So as far as all the solutions being presented, um, this is certainly an interesting one, but let's talk about another one. Have you guys heard of Bitcoin? No, so this is no. a new thing. A purse doesn't just want to be a wallet. They're also building a whole new cryptocurrency on the back end. Bitcoin is a Bitcoin spinoff that boasts full node implementation with support for SegWit, Lightning Network, uh, version bits, CSV, bit, BIP70, BIP... 151, 152, and 150, and mast. Currently, the coin is being developed and implemented privately. It is unclear how this coin will function with regards to the current Bitcoin network. So this is another new uh, solution out there. And really what I think we're seeing is the result of core development stagnation, is that so many more private solutions are being developed right now. Right. So uh, Competition of ideas. Now, 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 talking about Bitcoin development in in a more precise uh, context, we uh, the next story is is more of a technical story. So, Bitcrust, fast parallel block validation without UTXO indexing. Now, the UTXO is the unspent transaction output database that the Bitcoin software creates from the blockchain upon initialization. This database is updated each time a transaction is validated. It is done so in a one-at-a-time se sequential fashion. The current number of UTXOs, or unspent transaction outputs, is just under 50 million. Bitcrust is looking to do away with the UTXO blow bloat by using a compact representation of the blockchain called a spend tree. Spend trees will be able to verify transactions in parallel and even deal with competing blocks. They claim this method will be much more memory cache efficient. The uh, website goes on to, exp to say that the vast majority of inputs are spending recent outputs, and for those transactions, a spend index is used. A spend index is a very compact bit index with one bit for each transaction and one for each output. The spend index serves as a broom wagon, which may lag a few blocks behind the spend tree uh, behind until the spend tree catches up. I know this sounds really complicated. Mm -hmm. So, further addressing the UTXO bloat the Bitcrust software would prioritize transactions that have more inputs than outputs, thus obviously reducing the number of outputs that it is creating with each transaction. So this is, uh, this is really interesting stuff. And if you go to the website and look at it, there's some, you know, they have some pictures. I haven't read the white paper and done the math on it or anything like that. 
but to look at other solutions at hand and seeing more efficient ways to to deal with the UTEX. Yeah, this this is really the only outstanding problem for Bitcoin. Uh, uh, I mean, other than the governance issues that we we're seeing uh, the the uh, UTXO, uh, it it was calculated that it, if RAM prices continue to decrease as they are, and the UTXO continues to grow as it is, then you can expect nodes to be very expensive in the future. Okay, uh, just from the RAM cost. So uh, definitely uh, progress in this uh, in this direction kind of solves the whole thing. Almost. I mean, that's really the only problem that's left. Right. So uh, that, that's the way I, I see it. Yeah. So it, it, I think it's it's good to see this development too. And and then once again, you know this this uh, it might have a core like uh, participation. Certain members who who input on core also work on some of these other projects I mentioned. But the the thing is is like once again, there's no is development. anything going to happen un- until we solve the the current problem. I think I think nothing's going to happen until. Core is not responsible for development. You know what I'm saying? I'm thinking that Core has dug their heels in and and put all their chips behind the Segwit activation. Yeah. And now that's that's their only card. Like they didn't develop anything further, and because of that, they're now trying to rush. Maybe they're rushing some other development, but it's not working as intended or taking too long. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, is that there the market is providing a, a whole host of alternatives right now. Now, moving on and talking about more of the mining and, and more, once again, we're talking about mining news. Bitmain responds to the ASIC Boost critics. In a blog post on the Bitmain site, the admin looks to clear the air. ASIC Boost is a circuit design that allows for an increased efficiency of about 20% with ASIC Bitcoin mining. And it does so by just adjusting how the circuit performs the SHA-256 algorithm. Bitmain's blog post states that while they have tested it on the internet, there's no evidence that they or anyone else is using ASIC, bo- ASIC Boost on the mainnet. Quote, Bitmain holds the ASIC Boost patent in China. We can legally use it in our own mining farms in China to profit from it and sell the mining contracts to the public. This, however... It- Profitable is not something we would do for the greater good of Bitcoin, unquote. And then another quote from them, quote, adversarial thinking is not the only way. We suggest working with the patent owners so that the patent could be used by the public. If all mining equipment could use ASIC boost, it would lower the joules per gigahash cost of the total network hash rate and increase the making of Bitcoin network, uh, making the Bitcoin network even stronger. So the ASIC boost, boost method is not just a uh, covert attack on the Bitcoin proof of work function. It is an engineering optimization, unquote. And this is in regards to Gregory Maxwell's accusations. That Gregory Maxwell is basically accusing Bitmain of trying to hoard all of the the Bitcoin network power and create this sort of uh, uh, what's, through their what's, patents. What's wrong with companies coming out with creative ideas of boosting hash rate? Instead of, you know, saying everyone should use this technology, what about maybe another company coming up with something that's even better? Right. I, I, I think innovation is great. I think, honestly, I think the Bitcoin network already uses a tremendous amount of electricity to safeguard the blockchain. And being more efficient with that energy resource ought to be encouraged and not punished. I mean, they, the last spec uh, that I heard was as much as the country, it's approaching the, uh, the amount of electricity used by Denmark. You know, if we can take 20% of that down out of that usage, I think that's a but, good but thing. But then we, sh- we should look for innovations in, you know, lower power and not exactly faster ASICs. Because once somebody makes a faster one, everyone else is going to be at a competitive disadvantage, the producers of these devices. So they're going to, if they can't get, you know, this one because of patents, they'll try to come up with their own. But instead, maybe we should encourage just lower power without necessarily increasing the hash rate. I mean, Intel's done this uh, at times with some of their uh, steppings where they focused on lower power rather than trying to make the chip, you know, substantially faster. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good point. But it's it's just like, you know, that's that's sort of uh, it's not really incentivized, right? Well, how you're not necessarily incentivized to make a well, low power chip. Well, lower power, I mean, lower power will save on energy costs. It just has to be low enough where they would buy that chip over one that might be a little faster. I think you run into the issue where, like China, where electricity might be extremely cheap, 
you know, low, using a low power one versus a high capacity one, uh, it, it makes no sense to not use the high capacity one. So I don't see anything wrong with China using, you know, the advantage of cheaper power that they might have. Sure. I mean, you know, why not? Any, any. Well, this has caused a lot of hysteria. This ASIC boost thing has been pumped on some of the Bitcoin media sites and whatnot. And so basically Bitmain is saying, yes, we have developed this technology. We've tested it on the test net, but no one, including ourselves, is using it on the main net. And you're just uh, you're, you're just shouting about nothing. You're, you're calling crying wolf. But moving on, we have so much more to talk about. And we want to get to some Dash news with Darren. Yeah. What's 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 going on with Dash, Darren? Oh, yeah, with Dash. Uh, so uh, Kraken has enabled Dash trading. I believe that just happened today. So uh, Yeah, new news. So uh, that And I believe this is the one uh, from the proposal. Uh, there was uh, news about a, a major exchange accepting Dash at the end of March, and it was announced that it would be Ninja launched, which means not uh, told about beforehand, basically, or when it would happen. And so this this is Kraken. Kraken has uh, done their launch of uh, trading, and so you can trade uh, Dash for U.S. dollars, Bitcoin, or euros uh, with there. And uh, there's even a possibility that they might allow uh, margin trading in the future. And so, of course, the price has gone up a little bit with this news. Um, yeah, it's 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 gone up a yeah. little bit. It was down earlier in the week, and, yeah. and sort of. So. You know, it's it's Dash's price. Now we don't normally we don't. In fact, I'm not speculating, but Dash's price has been really interesting to watch. Right. You know, having reached that hundred dollar point, fallen down, reached it again, and surpassed it briefly. It's just sort of like at, I don't really know why it's doing what it's doing. I it don't, seems yeah, irrational. Who, who knows? But yeah, it did go up very quickly, very fast. Um. So. Uh, Yes. So, um, that, so you got another story yeah, here, yeah. and uh, Charlie Schrem. He uh, he is in Forbes Germany. So there's a. I, I couldn't find the German the magazine. Yeah, the magazine. I think this is only on the uh, print edition because I couldn't find anything online. But the the title is "Alles kann uh, Geld sein," which means all can be money, or yeah, all everything can be money basically, and. Um, so uh, they uh, talked to uh, Charlie, and he he does mention Dash uh, a, a few places in the article. So wow, uh, yeah. So uh, he's it, so I mean, he's still. Do we know what's the status of his proposal? To I mean, he's already working with. Uh, but it's passed. It's passed. So yeah. he's he's part of the Dash team as as far as that's yeah, concerned. He, yeah, he's on his own separate project, so he's not part sure. of the core developers. But he, um, yeah. So he's. Uh, on the hook to uh, deliver a MasterCard, which will accept Dash and allow you to make purchases. There you go. He's on the hook. He is. I mean, <laughs> that's what he's promised to do. And yeah. He's been paid to do it now. So There you go. Well, uh, Pedro, you got something interesting here. Yeah, Porsche is looking into blockchain. So, wow. So last week, Porsche announced a contest for blockchain solutions from the startup community. Uh, prizes are a chance to work with Porsche, 25,000 euro prize and three months participation at the Spin Lab Accelerator program. Uh, and of course, you know, all the media attention, you know, uh, that winning team would get. According to the release, Porsche aims to ex obtain external input on the disruptive potential of the blockchain transaction system by collaborating with uh, the startup scene. Uh, car manufacturers uh, have been showing interest in blockchain technology for security, pay on the go features, and data management. Uh, one German company, Enology, um, is an energy, an energy company, and they recently demonstrated an e-wallet for electronic cards where the car e-wallet uses blockchain technology to pay for highway tolls, electric charging, and parking fees. Wow. Okay, so that, that's, that seems like a lot of usage right there. Yeah, and I, A lot I've, of small payments. I've always thought of, uh, you know, the high-speed toll booths that we have. Uh, we have one here in New Hampshire. Yeah. Um, maybe we have more, but um, the one I'm referring to is the one north of uh, Manchester where you, you have a, a high-speed lane. You don't need to slow down. And that seems like a perfect thing for blockchain, right, where you could have, uh, you know, cars already have computers. You can have uh, an electronic wallet there, and you've authorized that it pays into this contract whenever, it, you know, the sensor trips. So... Um, you know, this is right. one potential use. Uh, charging stations um, are another. So, you know, car companies are getting more uh, into digital. 
Yeah, it's 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 great to see that. Um, and uh, in Germany too. I mean, it's it's all over the world. We normally talk a lot about American because we we only you know see a lot of American stories. They're just so uh, prevalent, and and especially if you get English speaking news. Um, but uh, to see this happening elsewhere, and the the other part, you know, the whole just being able to sign a message, you know, not even, not even sending bits, not even sending currency along, you know, a lot of these things we talked a few episodes ago about how just signing a, a message Val- could be done know, for a lot of different applications. Yeah. Validating, you know, usage, like a usage of, from your electric company doesn't mean you need to pay for every, you know, small fraction of electricity, but the meter would essentially be sending, you know, validation on the blockchain of what you used and then, you know, you would have a, an electronic account of some cryptocurrency that would then pay for that. This is, this is great stuff. All right, so moving on a little bit, uh, we've got a news from Steemit. Now, we haven't talked about Steemit in a while, but uh, Dan Larimer resigns from Steemit. The founder and lead developer, Dan Larimer, has resigned from Steemit, a blockchain-based social media platform. The initial goodbye was done with a two-sentence post and threw the community into turmoil. Dan later answered some questions and gave more of a reason for the sudden move. Quote, Steemit is dominated by politics beyond my ability to control or fix. The code is in good hands. The team is more than capable of implementing anything the community desires. Let's hope the community chooses wisely, unquote. Steemit Inc. will continue in a post from Ned hypes up the coming changes to the platform. Now, moving on, we're going to be talking a lot about Ethereum and Ethereum news. And uh, so start out... We talk about tokens a lot here, and Randy, while he's not on the show tonight, he did write up a pretty handy blog post, and you can find it at neocashradio.com, and the blog post details how you can store your Ethereum-based tokens on a hardware wallet. So we're talking about Golem, Rep tokens, and uh, Singular, uh, uh, basically anything Consensus does, uh, and then DAO tokens from a variety of different DAOs. So you can find that at neocashradio.com. And if you want to see more of what's going on with tokens, there's a new Explorer, Explorer, uh, the Explorer.io, E-T-H-P-L-O-R-E-R.io. And that has uh, the ability to view token information, including descriptions, uh, the contract information, holders and activity. And now, if you've got your... Uh, your Ethereum wallet, and you want to watch, you want to see the tokens that you bought inside the uh, wallet, you definitely want to go and get that proper contract uh, address so you can uh, fill it in your watch token section of the wallet. Um, and that's pretty handy to have there because I often just Google search or not, I start page search because I don't, I don't I try not to use Google too much. Right. Um, I use DuckDuckGo. DuckDuckGo. I use I like Start it. Page. What do you use, Pedro? Uh, I use. I have to admit, I use Google a lot. Okay. Well, yeah. With, with DuckDuckGo, I can put uh, exclamation G, and then it'll search Google for me. And or you can put exclamation YF, it'll search you know Yahoo Finance or exclamation SP, it'll search Start Page. All wow. kinds of things. Yeah. Good stuff. Cool. Exclamation A, Amazon if you're shopping. All right. Lots of fun. So, yeah, it, check those, uh, both the uh, website uh, to find out about hardware wallet token holdings and then check out spor.io and see if you like the site. Um, I think Etherscan also has some ability to look up contract addresses. Uh, but moving on to talk about tokens. Once again, gold token debit cards on the Ethereum blockchain. Just that that phrase is, is a great phrase. It's uh, gold what? token. So, you know, I've heard of these yeah. things, and I, I, I'm skeptical, I guess. Digits Global, uh, the Digix DAO, DGD, is partnering with Monolith Studio to bring tokenized gold to a debit card. So Digix DAO is already tokenizing gold, and apparently they have a bunch of different uh, methods to ensure the gold supply, and they have audits and all who, that sort of stuff. Who holds the gold? Uh, it's, I, believe, it's, I believe it's in several repositories, but... Is it physical gold or just gold certificates? It's, I believe it's physical gold, like actual gold, like gold. So, uh, you, so you do th- still have to trust that they're holding it securely, right? Uh, yes, of course, of course you do. I mean, it's it's definitely one of those things where I'm like, huh? I'm scratching my head at it, but it's, they're doing it. And, well, the other big, I guess the bigger story here is that Monolith Studios is creating something called a token card. 
and it's going to be powered by the Ethereum blockchain. The card will hold Ether and any of the ERC20 tokens. So Monolith Studios is going to be holding a crowd, crowd sale soon for, for this token card. But it looks to be uh, similar to some of the other cards that are being developed. The, uh, it's a visa, it looks to be a Visa card uh, out of Singapore and uh, maybe other places. I don't know precisely, but uh, you, we have links on our website to both of these locations. You can find out about the Digix, uh, the Digital Gold. And you can also find out about Monolith Studios. And you can make your own decision because I definitely encourage you to make your own decision. Um, now these ERC20 tokens, so what, what basically happened is the Ethereum community, uh, suggested and created their own, their own standard. It's like the blue chips? Some, it's something like that. What? Yeah, e so they, ERC20 they've created token? Their, they've created their own standard for, uh, tokens. And what this, this does is it basically means that, um, any wallet that can handle an ERC20 token handles all ERC20 tokens. And if you make your token as a standard, then wallet, oh, wallet it's, makers... it's like a protocol. Yeah, it's a protocol for how the... It basically ensures that your token can respond to a certain set of commands that wallets will issue to send and move tokens. And receive and yeah. move to somebody else. And yeah, Things like that. So um, now <laughs> it's interesting because the Golem project... Uh, which is a token. We just we mentioned Golem last week. Pedro had a nice story about them. The Golem project finds a critical flaw in the ERC twenty tokens. Now, <laughs> this is definitely a concern. Now, what if what if the standard itself has some flaws to it? Well, uh, Paul, well, then maybe we need ERC twenty one. Right. Paul Bailica writes about the discovery of a bug with the GNT token transfer transaction from a crypto exchange. Upon examination, the bug could be used to potentially empty the exchange of all Golem tokens. Peter Vesenius chimed in and noted that this exploit could have been used uh, could be used to attack any of the ERC20 tokens. The bug has been fixed with the exchange, but the word is out to take additional steps to improve the security of the ERC20 token standard. So all that I've read about it, and I don't know the details behind this, is that this would only affect an exchange. This yes, this particular exchange. There's one exchange in which they noticed this, and I don't, I don't know if they tested all exchanges, but what I'm saying is the the software problem was with the exchange and how the exchange handled tokens, right? right. And, and so, and, and they should improve. What they're saying is improve the standard so that you know that can't happen. Well, improve the standard, but also educate uh, the exchanges on how to best use the ERC CR twenty standard. Uh, I think that's an important part too. Is you could create a standard, but if you don't tell the the vendors and uh, clients that are actually using your standard how to use it, then like good documentation and good guidance. documentation. I think this is uh, you know a little column A, a little column B as far as whose fault it is. But then again, I don't really know. I'm not a coder. Um, so moving on, you have a story here, Pedro. Yes. Yeah, so the Ethereum name service bug bounty is live. Uh, so the first launch attempt for the Ethereum name service. Uh, last month was canceled due to a bug that would allow someone who bid during the reveal phase uh, could then wait until they know what their opponents bid and then either outbid, underbid, or do nothing. Uh, so a, a check for this is needed. So they decided to delay uh, the release. Uh, now what they have is um, they've, they're now included in the Ethereum Bug Bounty Program. Uh, and the Ethereum Bug Bounty Program provides bounties for bugs. Uh, we call on the community and all bug bounty hunters to help identify bugs in the protocols and clients, earn rewards for finding a vulnerability, and get a place on the leaderboard. Um, so there's a, a link to the website, and you can see, like, all the rules and, and rewards section for, for the details. But uh, I, I think this is good for the community, um, any software development community, to have, you know, uh, some type of bug bounty program because, you know, us usually some of the most clever people... Um, you know, just need just that little bit of motivation to spend some time and look through some code. Um, and, and this could be a very efficient way to get that done. Yeah, it's, but, you know, like, like, yeah, we totally, the whole idea of incentivized results, you know, you want to get something done, you know, pay someone well enough to do it. And, you know, that's, it's the whole, uh, there is something to be said for that you get what you pay for. You yeah, know, and, it, there's, and, 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 and things are moving so fast in this space. Yes. I mean, there's so many great ideas and, and, and you want to be first on the market. and But it needs more than just, you know, a hardcore group of core developers and a whole bunch of volunteers that, 
you know, will will help check it out. I think you need that in between layer of you know some incentivized group of people to be uh, good, and it's not just the the money, but you know they mentioned the leaderboard. A lot of this is about street cred, right? You yeah. show yourself as like top notch and finding bugs in, in say the the Bitcoin or the Dash or the Monero or whatever ecosystem, then yeah, you you might be able to get a you know that might help you with your career. Uh, it'll del- definitely help you to make some good contacts in the business. Totally, and it's it's sort of like in the in the wild west of the digital era, the bugs are the villains, the outlaws, and you know more people hunting them down and finding them. That means a more secure, you know. Yeah, it, it's one thing when when a software bug is a little glitch in a video game. Uh, yeah, it's another thing when a software bug has to do with financial stuff. Yeah, like you know, we you know we really have to be careful. We don't want people, you know, when I say we, I mean the whole crypto community. Uh, we don't want you know people losing money because of bad code, right? Well, uh, you can tune in to Neocash Radio every Wednesday nights, to, and you can visit our website at neocashradio.com dot com, where we have a write up and and links to all the blog posts, or I'm sorry, all the uh, the news articles that we've sourced. And of course, if you want to email us, Darren, Darren at neocashradio.com. dot com. That's right. How do you spell that, Darren? D a r r e n at neocashradio.com. dot com. Excellent. And so for Neocash Radio, this is JJ, Darren, and Pedro. Neocash Radio, where we discuss the future of money today. Neocashradio.com. <laughs>